Hello everyone, and we're going to be working on today chapter 4, the Anabaptist Reformation and its triumph in America. The Radical Reformation emerges from Rock and Sand by Archpriest Josiah Trenum. And we'll start with this quote here. Inevitably, Zwingli's followers began to accuse him of the very thing he himself had accused Martin Luther of insufficient reformation. Zwingli was styled as a compromised man with the civil authorities and was criticized for not being, quote, biblical enough. Zwingli responded aggressively, but in vain. And a little ways down here, an important just sentence is, uh, and what are the tenets of this faith that has, more than any other form of Protestantism, so deeply influenced American religion? And so this chapter, we're going to be talking about Anabaptism. Uh, Elisha, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Man, I mean, they really hit hard on Zwingli opening in this chapter. I noticed that we deal with these figures in history, you know, such as Martin Luther or Mueller, M Mutzler or Zwingli. And these, these guys, they, they definitely get a, a crowd that calls them out. And, you know, it's kind of interesting to see how you know, the same crowd that, that is basically saying, you know, we support you and your teachings and your perspective now comes back and says, you're not doing it enough. You're not, you're not measuring up, um, to the quality and standards of what we were looking for. And so now, you know, we're kind of turning our back to you. Yeah. And it, it's not clear, um, like if it's the same people like, um, who, who um, is in the in the form of like they support they you know keep on accusing like accuse Luther and then accuse the next one you know um, but it it you do see this of it's each it seems like this pattern I can you can, I can see if you agree with me or not there's this pattern of uh, you know like Luther and then maybe Zwingli accuses Luther of not going far enough and then. We've got the Anabaptist accusing Zwingli of not going far enough, not being good enough. So it's it's this pattern that I think you you keep seeing over and over in Protestantism, and I think you see uh, throughout the the book, and I think you will see as we go along. I think that's a really really good observational point. You know, I just wanted to take a moment and think about the Old Testament in Israel, where you know they were having some really um, heart problems, you know, issues with living up to being a holy people. And their solution, they thought, was, is we need a king. We need a king. And they kept telling God how much they needed a king. And the king came around, and then they ended up, that king fell, and God gave him another king, even though he kept telling him, like, you know, I am the king. You know, I am, I'm the one you need to solve these, these heart problems. But I don't think they realized very quickly. I don't think the, the people there and some of these people in this the, these times realize that the real solution to what they're looking for is God, and you're not going to find it in, into in a man-made character. You know, I I mean, I don't know. I just see a, a brief correlation. So you kind of see maybe what you might be critiquing at least some of the Protestants as being too driven by being like certain personal focused on certain personalities. Uh, maybe personality, but really just the, the idea that in order to really get to the root of truth, we need someone there to interpret and to be glamorous in a way, to be a little bit more polished. When, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I think God's word was given to us so that all people, you know, whether you are the most educated or maybe you're just new to this, can receive his word. Mm -hmm. And not saying that any of these leaders don't understand God's word or, or don't conceptually get it, but I think their audience doesn't realize what their position really is, is that their leader's position is, is, is to kind of chime in and say affirm or or to correct a little bit of, of perspective. And so I think in this case of Zingling, Zingling I think his, his audience really is saying, look, we want more of what you've already been giving us, but we're not satisfied. 
Right. So the uh, what do you think of like the whole this continuing um, habit of different each each successive person or movement kind of being critical of the Protestant movement that they're that it kind of comes before them. What what do you think of that? I guess when we when we start to kind of it's very easy, sorry, it's very easy when you're looking at this to zoom all the way in. We're zoomed in. So I, I often think that we, if we were living in this time, it'd be really hard to zoom out. Zoom out to the big picture. The big picture of what redemption looks like. The big picture of how to handle some of the social issues or cultural issues of those times. You know, when you're in the thick of it or the or in the middle of life where things are going and happening really, really quickly, you don't see how, in some cases, you're repeating history or you're, you're in the cycle of trying to solve something but trying to do it the same way. Um, there was an analogy that was told to me when I was younger. Um, you know, some people in life... They don't realize that they're running into a brick wall and they keep running into the same brick wall when the door is right next to them. And they could literally just walk through the door instead of walking into the wall. Mm-hmm. And that's just an observation piece as we read. You know, do I know deeply exactly what was happening in those times? No. But based off the author and the observations of what we do know, we can definitely see that some of these leaders, prestigious leaders maybe in a way, um, definitely suffered from people misunderstanding what their position is. Yeah, so, you, and you can tell me if you think this is right or not. You think maybe there, there's this kind of tradition of being overly critical, maybe the too revolutionary, too trying to keep on progressive, because it's a very, in a way, in a certain sense, it's very progressive because it's like, you keep on moving forward in terms of criticizing the past. Um, I mean, I think you're headed in the right direction on that path because even to this date, you know, we always get really, really excited of something new. You know, yeah. what's the newest news? Have you ever noticed that sometimes the newest news that you just heard about is sometimes maybe more than 24 hours old? So, what is new news? You know, I mean, I think we just chase that shiny object and. I don't think that's something new in history. Yeah. So we, another passage here, which is interesting. So it's talking about um, one of these uh, Anabaptist Munzer, which some of these Anabaptists got kind of crazy um, in terms of their beliefs. Uh, if you study Protestantism, early Protestantism, you, you, you learn about Anabaptism and, and different things. Um, so Munzer asserted in this sermon that his teaching was absolutely clear from the Bible saying quote this passage of Daniel is thus as clear as the sun and the process of ending the fifth monarchy of the world is in full swing bold absolute claims on the basis of novel interpretations of apocalyptic passages of scripture became common fare for Protestant preachers and have been heard from their pulpits for 500 years This has been especially true since the middle of the 19th century when a great interest in prophecy and eschatology arose in Protestant circles. Numerous invented and detailed schemes of eschatological drama have been articulated, including the pre-, mid-, and post-tribulation rapture theories, the 1,000-year earthly millennium, the rebuilding of the Jewish temple, the return of the Jews to the Holy Land, and numerous other details that have spawned the creation of entire Protestant denominations and influenced American politics and foreign policy. And then just a, um, the footnote, which is from this uh, section here. Baylor, 1991. Um, skipping over here. It should be noted that eschatological speculation and overconfidence in prophetical interpretation was something quite consistently apparent in the work of most of the re- reformers. Luther was certain that Daniel 2 Daniel referred to the Turks. Hmm. Very interesting. So we see here this wading into interpreting 
very uh, difficult passage of scripture like Daniel, like um, there was some some talk of here Revelation as well. I know in the the I believe in all Eastern Orthodox churches, Revelation is not used in Bible readings because it's considered too complicated. It's still you know it's still in the like the Orthodox study Bible, but it's not used in readings during service because of how complicated it is. Um, so that's interesting. So we see this we see this um, these tendencies early on. Yeah, I think uh, this is another point of op- opposition a little bit from from Mutzler to Luther, uh, mainly because, uh, you know, he believed so strongly in what he believed and what he saw and what he read, he went out of his way. It says he preached and wrote with venom, calling Dr. Martin Luther, Dr. Liar. He became increasingly ap- apocalyptic, and in his sermon before the princes, preached on the prophecy of the second chapter of Daniel, arguing that the kingdom of God was presently overwhelmingly overthrowing the political structure. So I just, I wanted to highlight that because we're looking at both leaders, both both inspirational people who, you know, they're saying, you know, I went to scripture and I dug deep and I'm looking at theology and I'm looking at, you know, different angles of, of my worldview. And this person who's supposedly doing the same exact thing in, in a way, they come out with two different resolutions and it's interesting how, you know, not only are you trying to, are they battling truth, but they're also battling opposition of someone else's truth. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because it says, you know, in the beginning of that passage that I just read, it's talking about how obvious he's saying it is, even though I think a lot of Daniel and revelation are complicated yeah, yeah, I and, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I noticed you you did make a comment about revelation and and the challenges that some denominationals face with interpreting what's going on in that chapter. Um, you know, I think because of there are rules or guidelines that that play in hermeneutics, uh, you're definitely going to get an out out uh, an outcome that's a little bit different depending on who is reading it and how and how they're reading it. Yeah, and I think also it's it's important to mention um, all the once once from my perspective, what you see like reading this book is you get these different Protestants and they're all pointing to go towards Scripture, but being largely detached from tradition, they're getting all these different interpretations and meanings, and they're all saying it's the obvious true one, but they all they're all having. There's a lot of disagreements. Yeah. um, I would say that they all say the same thing, but when it comes down to how you break it down and how you interpret interpret things, you're looking at what are they they truly referencing? Who do they consider as a, a figure of their time or what resources are they consulting to make sure that they're falling in alignment with whatever they believe. And I think that's why it comes out differently because you've got bias that plays into this. Right. And I think ultimately a lot of times the one of the main sources was just their own reason and and thoughts on it. Yeah. And then in the passage, I'm not going to read it because it's kind of uh, I, I don't think I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it talks more about the peasants rebellion. Martin Luther playing into kind of the brutal putting down of the Peasants' Rebellion, which I think we might have talked about already. This passage here is talking about some of the craziness. Another strange expression, apparently on the fringe of Anabaptism, was a group of extremists who took over the city of Munster and proclaimed it the, quote, New Jerusalem. The godless were to be slain, Old Testament polygamy was to be restored, all property was to be held in common, and infant baptism and the Lord's Supper were described as rites of the Antichrist. For 1400 years, the truth has been falsified and repressed. 
they articulated in the 1534 document, a restora- restitution of Christian teaching by Bernard Rothman. John Math- Mathijs-, Mathijs served as the new King David for six weeks. Then he was killed by Catholic troops who besieged the city. Such was the nature of political unrest and social confusion during the early years of the Reformation. And it, it is with this in mind that we turn to the Anabaptist. Mm. And then one footnote here. Uh, one Protestant political principle was exceedingly clear. The Protestant princes could steal land at will from the papacy, but the Protestant peasants better not. It's kind of... Mm. Little, little, little humorous, dump- humorous note there. Yeah. Um, passage here highlighting baptism and the Eucharist. Uh, two passages. Significantly, Hubmeyer also affirms that correct baptism has been, quote, lost for a thousand years. That true Christian baptism was of adult believers only, and that infant baptism is, quote, no baptism, but rather idolatry, because the child knows neither good nor evil. This affirmation itself denied the baptism of virtually every Christian in the Western world at this time. In the Catechism, this is a little, just shortly farther on, Hubmeyer also maintained the bread and wine of the Eucharist are nothing but memorial symbols, and explicitly asserted that Christ only instituted the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist, both of which are merely outward signs. Mm -hmm. Big, big, big uh, differences that are pointed out and how the worldview is different because I can tell you from the background of being uh, with the Lutheran Church, they're going to tell you that it is the literal sense of his body and blood. And so that's that's an interesting phrase to, to point out on how this person is saying it's a memorial symbol. It's just a symbolism right. of something. And that, yeah, and I, I think the well, a lot of Lutherans, they would say, they're definitely it's definitely in the ballpark of what you said. I think they would say that it's not, they say... How would they? Say? They would probably say it's the real presence. It's in, above, and within, or however they say it. Very fluently, <laughs> because in a it's a special manner. Yeah, because sort. it's kind of different. Because it, because literal that literal body and blood would be transubstantiation, but it is in the general ballpark. I get not of transubstantiation, but of they lean more that way. Yeah, not transubstantiation, but of the presence of Christ. I would say. So the presence to, of Christ. Just to clarify. To clarify, yeah. yeah. Not trans, uh, transubstantiation, but the I, the talk and the language is very carefully chosen um, based to based on the correlation of Scripture is what they would probably say. Yeah, yeah. They're they're in the ballpark, but there's some there's some they, you know difference. This is something they would definitely automatically den- deny. It's not just a symbol. Uh, yeah, traditional Lutherans would. Yeah. 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 Then the chapter talks about Menno Simons and some other things. Uh, one passage here, it says, What sets the Radical Reformation apart from what is called in modern times the Magisterial Reformation is the fact that these believers not only were not supported by political entities, but most ex- eschewed politics on principle. All of the various confessions of faith articulated by Anabaptist thinkers express more radical definitions of separation from traditional Christian belief and practice. Mm. One interesting passage here, uh, the concept of Cologne 1591, excuse me, in 1591, a synod of Dutch and high German ministers met to heal the splinter movement and produce, produce the concept of Cologne designed to unify the Mennonite churches. This confession is noteworthy to Orthodox Christians since it is virtually the only Protestant statement of faith not to embrace the filioque heresy. 
On the contrary, the confession reproduces the language of the Council of Ferrara, Florence, 1439, affirming that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. This statement of faith also restricts marriage to within the Anabaptist movement and affirms the practice of foot washing. The central hmm. confession of the Mennonite churches summarize, summarizing these fundamental tenets is the Dordrecht Confession, 1632. And it's, then it uh, just talks about Anabaptists today, the Mennonites, the Amish, the Baptists. Uh, yeah. It's interesting how they needed to be healing, you know, because they were having some division, it looks like. And this is what they concluded in how, like, history, man, if you miss out on some of these events, you don't realize how the language and the culture of that denomination or, or people group uh, shifts. And so in, it says, you know, in that, in that passage you just read, in 1439, this shift to affirming the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and through the Son. And prior to that, it wasn't so prevalently spoken about or accepted. So it's interesting. Uh, yeah, so the... I, I'd have to look, but I believe that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son is the traditional um, understanding. And then it will actually change with the Western Church eventually um, becoming more prominent with the Western Church uh, roughly after the schism between the Orthodox and Catholic Churches. And then a lot of Protestants just adopted the Catholic viewpoint on it without really much disagreement or critique. And that's why I read that passage was because these are Protestants who actually broke from that, broke from the Western tradition, really, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. So, like David was saying, it does highlight, and I think it's worth noteworthy that, you know, anyone reading this book, don't rush over this section where it's talking about this uh, this change, and it breaks down. It gives you a little bit more in it insight on these Anabaptist groups that are associated with it. So, you know, it mentions how the Mennonites are the largest direct descendants to the Mennonites, uh, to, to the Anabaptists. Um, and their name takes after Menno Simon. Uh, it talks about the Amish, and sometimes uh, they, they're called the Amish Mennonites, uh, and they are divi- they're a division of that. Among the Swiss Brethren under the leadership of J- Jacob Amon, does that sound right? Yeah, something like that. Something yeah. around those lines. These names are kind of crazy. And then it moves into the Baptists and how they kind of associate to that. It talks about from the mid-17th century, Baptist churches existed in the American colonies. Um, the settlement of Roger Williams at Providence, Rhode Island, and the church formed there in, in 1639 on Baptist principles is regarded is generally regarded as the beginning of the American Baptist history. The oldest Baptist church is the South. In the South is First Baptist Church of Charleston, South Carolina, which was organized in 1682. So they got a long, long history that it kind of chimes on. And it, and, it, and then I wanted to highlight something about uh, the Baptists. The Baptists are one of the largest Protestant and free church communes and free church communes in the world with a membership of over 35 million persons. The Southern Baptist Convention is the world's largest Baptist denomination and the largest Protestant denomination by far in America, with some 16 million adherents in 42,000 church. And it goes into this thing that was noteworthy. The word Southern reflects the convention it reflects that the convention became a separate denomination in 1845 in Augusta, Georgia. The convention's churches are still most concentrated in South, but there are 42 states' conventions throughout the U.S. The issue of slavery divided the various Baptist churches, and the SBC actually formed itself in order to defend white su- supremacy and the validity of slavery. In, 19, in 1995, the SBC adopted a resolution to renounce its race's roots. Um, the SBC is famous for its theological controversies and disagreements within the convention, and the the Baptist faith and the message is the basic confession of the SBC. The SBC self identity includes, besides classic Anabaptist emphasis, also a strong emphasis upon mission work. Um, and I think it was just interesting to see that, like, not only are, are these this group 
facing a lot of different changes. Like the fact that they had to make a, a stand in a clear um, defining moment of defending in order to defend themselves from white supremacy and the validity of slavery. That that's kind of crazy that you had the form within that. So interesting how culture affects affects these these changes. And more recently, I think the, it seems, I don't know much but about this topic, but it seems like the Southern Baptist Convention, which has been known for being conservative, is becoming more liberal, at, at least it kind of appears that way. Like I said, I don't know much about it. And it, it also appears that I think a lot of Baptist churches, this is not to say that like the there's like um, necessarily like uh, racial strife or anything, but a lot, I think a lot of times there tend to be either predominant, like a lot of times the Baptist churches tend to be mostly black or mostly white. I think that's, and that's not, there's probably some negative racial stuff, but it's also probably some just natural organization as well, if that makes sense. I mean, it highlights here that about two-thirds of all black American Protestants are Baptists. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of interesting that, you know, it kind of falls in line with that. And I, and I think that's very true. Um, but I think the highlight of the of the, the point of, of the history behind that and where it associates, it's kind of ingrained in, in the history of, of slavery and kind of probably why there's so many that kind of grab that have been a part of the, the Baptist roots. You know, it's just bringing that observation, like there were things in history that were happening. Um, and when the church was developing in this, in the area of this Baptist, that it's not surprising that there are a lot of people who are black that are, um, that are in the Baptist Protestant area. Mm -hmm. And it says, uh, let's see. Protestant evangelicals who share many fundamental Anabaptist tenets, whether or not they belong to a denomination formally called Baptist, number approximately 70 million persons in America. It's quite a few people. Yeah. Which means there's a lot of people who have some kind of faith in America. It just varies depending on who you talk to. So I wanted to highlight something that is kind of important of what the author is saying in this chapter. Just one of the biggest differences you heard earlier was infant baptism and the Orthodoxy Church and, and the difference between Orthodoxy and Baptist. Um, you know, me being a Protestant over here, I'm, I'm just kind of, I wanted to hint on the inference that they were putting in here. It says, whether or not we American Christians have ever been officially associated with the Baptist movement we have been deeply affected by this movement, this movement and its worldview in more, in more ways than any of us know. The theology and practice of infant, infant baptism is the heart of the Baptist millennia and, and American individualism. The name Baptist, this is something new, comes from the belief that infants should not be baptized and that the only individual who are mentally mature and developed enough to make a reasonable and conscious decision should be baptized. And I find that interesting because that is, I think, one of the div division points or differences um, that I think that they would definitely say, yeah, this is something that we stand on. And it's interesting how the, that incorporates into the literal word Baptist. You know, I didn't really know how deeply rooted that was associated to the definition. Yeah. An interesting passage here also talking about baptism. One short anecdote about the relevance of this issue within American society today comes from an Orthodox priest whom I know. He held a European doctorate with extensive experience in higher education and was an administrator at an evangelical Protestant university. His high position in the university provoked a response by numbers of concerned alumni. A letter was written to the provost to document their concerns. At the top of their list of, con of concerns was this. Quote, it has been reported that this dean believes in, practices, and has not repented of baptizing babies, end quote. What is the orthodox Christian response to those who refuse to baptize infants and stigmatize our churches 
practice is sinful? Our answer is this. The baptism of infants is both a biblical practice and one that has a great measure of unanimity in church history and tradition. Mm. I feel like I just wanted to reify one of the closing comments of this uh, section. And it, it, it just plays on what I was talking about, the infant baptism. It says, infant baptism has remained the standard practice for the vast majority of the Protestant communion, communion individual, in, including the Church of England, the Reformed Churches, which is the Presbyterianism, the Methodists, and the Wesleyan Churches, and the Lutheran Churches. So these are something that are really esteemed or held as an, a big piece of their theology or their, their their doctoral view. So you can see why there's tension, you know, between these different denominations and viewpoints. Yeah, some more, another quote here concerning baptism. There are numerous texts throughout the New Testament which relate the salvation of whole households at the same time. The salvation of the household is the usual New Testament pattern, not the salvation of independent individuals. And... Then there's some verses here. Uh, I'm not completely sure of the... I think it's Acts 10, 2, Hebrews 11, 7 through 9, and Matthew 10, 12 through 14. And, and the other passage mentioned here is John 4, 53. This household formula of baptism is conspicuously present in the date of the New Testament and leads to the undeniable conclusion that the general practice was the baptism of an entire household at one time. The baptism of individuals one by one, as is practiced and emphasized by the Baptist movement, was not the practice of the first Christians. These references to receiving the covenant sign of baptism are couched in the exact same language as the references to Abraham's reception of the covenant sign of circumcision, the Old Testament pattern of giving God's salvation and the sign thereof to the whole household, including influence, remember Isaac, carries right over into the New Testament. As a matter of fact, there is not one reference in the New Testament to any person being baptized who had been raised in a Christian home and had finally become an adult and able to exercise reason, believe, and be baptized. It simply did not happen. Infants were baptized together with the whole household, and those infants who were born into a Christian family were given the grace of baptism as infants after the pattern of Abraham. And then... The final section I'm going to read here. The reversal of our Savior's teaching that to children belong the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus Christ taught, saying, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Far from being unbaptized Christians and second-class citizens of the church, Orthodox Christians' children are both fully baptized, chrismated, and communing members of the body of Christ and the models for adults. It is not the children who must grow up and become like adults in order for them to be baptized and saved, as the Baptist would have us believe, but, on the contrary, it is the adults who must be converted and become like children if they hope to be saved. Hmm. Well, I think that brings about some clarity on the viewpoints, and I think it's good that it's been acknowledged by this author. Um... A lot of history, a lot of critical points and differences, and I think we saw that um, Martin Luther faced a lot of challenges, and more to come. So, I think we're going to leave it here. Thank you for listening, and please like, share, and subscribe.